hear some more. All right, so welcome everyone. My name is Lara Villamont. I am the head of outreach and community experience here at the Framingham Public Library. Welcome to tonight's lifelong learning lecture. And this is a partnership with the Framingham State University. In tonight's lecture, we are thrilled to be joined by Dr. Larry McKenna. He's a professor of physics and earth science. And he's also the co-founder of the Center of Climate Change Education. Tonight's lecture, he's going to be talking with us about what is it about time and human nature that allows us to experience the time of COVID in such unexpected ways? Still very much, unfortunately, uh, a relevant topic for tonight. Um, a few notes before we get started. Dr. McKenna is going to break his lecture into three separate parts. And after each of the pieces, we'll turn on the option to unmute and have you post your questions either in the chat or next to your name. You should have the little raise hand option. Um, we'll take questions and comments at that time. And then we'll also have a little bit longer section at the end for any additional questions. As you heard the lovely lady telling you we are recording tonight's program. So it will be posted to our YouTube page. Usually it takes about five days for us to be able to get it up there. So if there's anybody who was not able to be here tonight, please go ahead and point them at our YouTube page. And last but not least, I will be posting a evaluation form for the library in the chat. We would love to hear from you, see what you thought, add your name to our mailing list if you are interested, and of course, get you signed up for other events. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. McKenna. Hi, Laura, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you for having me. Uh, Laura and I have been scheduling this for quite some time, and to both of our dismays, if that's the way of putting it, uh, we're not in the same building. I'm here in the wonderful laboratory of time at Framingham State University, and you're all, all over the world, uh, which in some ways makes it more fun today. If you've come to some of my talks in the past, this one's going to be a little different. You can already see I've got all sorts of props around here, uh, things going back and forth, uh, things, oh, this one you can't see, I'll bring it over here. Uh, this thing going back and forth. Eventually, I'll warn you that we're going to be using a strobe light. So if you're sensitive to that, beware. I'll give you a good heads up. Uh, we're going to be going in and out of a PowerPoint demonstration. And because I'm here in the lab, I can actually do some fun things. Uh, as Laura said, this is a story in three acts. The time is tough. And, and one of the things I wanted to do with this talk, because COVID has been such an odd experience for us. I know I just walked out of the camera. I'm sorry. Um, and up here, I'm too close. So I'll go back over there. One of the things that has surprised me about COVID is how it has changed our perception of time, how it's changed our perception of what we do as normal. And I wanted today to look at that because I don't think we should let this time go by. I don't think we should let this time of COVID disappear without a little bit of thinking about why it is affecting us so much. And so the three parts that I'm going to do today are three acts. Uh, well, here, I'll tell you what, let's, uh, let's show. And I'm going to share my screen. Um, we're going to come in and out of share, which can be occasionally uh, disruptive, but it should be okay. And Laura, will you tell me, uh, will you give me an okay that you can see the little screen there? Yep, we see you just fine. Great, thank you. Um, and so again, thank you to Framingham Public Library and thank you to Framingham State University. Uh, for giving me the little time lab here. And so what are we going to do today? It's time in the time of COVID. And we're going to ravel into time uh, by a sub-sub-temporium. For those of you who are familiar, the literary references are there because if we simply try to understand time as a physical manifestation of something, I don't think we have much fun. And so instead, what I'd like to do is look at time in three different ways. They're roughly historical. We're going to start with uh, a look at mechanical time, and we'll have three scenes to this act, the conception of time, perception of time, and how time is lived by people. And then we're going to go to act two, uh, after some questions, sorry, after some questions, we'll go to act two, we'll look at atomic time in a different way than you think, maybe. And again, conception, perception, live, and then questions. And then finally, in act three, we'll look at relativistic time. And again, not quite the way you think, uh, but we'll look at conception, perception, live, and then finally, we'll have questions. Um, how would I sum it all up? But holy salt, Martin, why can't you beat time? If you've ever tried, like I have, to read Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce, you know exactly what I mean by time. Because, of course, Finnegan's Wake is almost unreadable. 
And it's unreadable because it doesn't follow our conception of time, like COVID. And so what I want to do today, it's a little weird. I want to look at time physically, in literature, and in perception. So let's start with Act 1, Mechanical Time. And hold on. So, okay, so I have a, I, just so we get this straight, look, it's unavoidable. Every time I make a bad pun about time, I'm going to ring the bell like that so that you know, I know I'm making a bad pun. So hold on, here's the first one. I've got to put a timer on my phone so I know what time it is because I don't have a clock here, which is ironic, but funny. All right, so hold on. Let me bring my clock up. There we go. And now I know what time it is. Good. Okay, let's start with a traditional notion of time as an infinite continuous flow that nonetheless is divided up in discrete repetitive intervals. That's the theme for this first section. We're human. And so we have to, when we start looking at what time is physically, we have to recognize that we have our biases and these biases are caused by the fact that we cannot escape the fact that we're humans. And so when we look at that, we, we tend to find that time happens in time. If you find that completely unsatisfying, welcome to today's talk. We find that time happens in relation to other things in time and space. We're going to find that measuring time is impossible unless you're having a relationship with the rest of the universe. Lost in, a, in, a, in an infinite darkness, would time even exist? And we have to realize that, that as we look at things, time has two forms. There's the absolute time, the, the tick-tock, tick-tock that's happened some, some beginning time. You'd have to count them. Uh, the first warning of, of a strobe light. I mean, for example, what you might be able to do is just turn on your strobe light. And you might be able to, sorry, I'll turn it down so it's not quite so annoying. There we go. So, oh, I see. Okay, so there's a tick, tick, tick. There's an absolute time. And if you counted those, you would have some absolute time. On the other hand, there's relative time, uh, the time of before and after. And this is a bit awkward, but I'm for the first time, I'm going to just stop sharing for a minute. And again, this is more fun live, uh, but we can't do that right now. So that's okay. We'll just have to live with it. Um, and I'm going to come up really close to the camera, a little scary. I'm going to show you this uh, particular rock. And you can see from the, the, the rock right here, you can see there's this, uh, this gold thing here that's actually pyrite. That's fool's gold. And you can see some other white dots. You can see a white dot there. And one of the things about this rock that's interesting is you can tell right away what the relative time of these two things is. This rock had to be formed after that little silvery gold guy did. This rock had to form after that white crystal did. That relative time is for always. If we know that this little white dot formed before the rock as a whole, no matter how much absolute time goes by, that relationship never, ever changes. And you don't need to know the absolute age of this rock in order to know the relative age of the components. But if you ask for the absolute age, I can tell you. This rock is the oldest thing you can hold in your hands in the globe. This rock is 4,567.8 billion billion years old. It is the stuff from which the earth was made. These white little thingies here are called calcium aluminum inclusions, and they are literally older than the solar system and older than the planet earth itself. It, it's amazing to hold something in your hand that's that old. But why? Why is experiencing time like that interesting? And that's what we want to explore tonight. So I'm going to go back to sharing. And again, I apologize for the bopping in and out. There we go. Um, so absolute relative. The next thing we got to get is time is a vector. It only flows one way from past to present to future. Nothing else in the universe does that. Time is unique in the universe in that it only goes one way. And that one way vector of time is because of something called the second law of thermodynamics and something called entropy. And so if you were to, for example, 
take two exactly identical. And I'm going to stop sharing again. Um, if you were to take two exactly identical isolated systems and you were to put, say, some dye, some potassium permanganate in one and leave the other absolutely unchanged, there's my potassium permanganate, we're going to let this sit for a while. You're going to have no difference, no problem telling me which came first and which came second. That is, I haven't added any dye to this one yet. I'm going to add some dye to it a little later. This one has already started to have that potassium permanganate diffuse all the way through. You, as well as I, know that there is no chance that all the potassium permanganate in this one would suddenly go back into being crystalline form, jump out of the beaker, and look like this. And that's because of the second law of thermodynamics. The second law tells us that time has a direction because any system tends to go ultimately towards the greatest disorder. And in this case, the disorder is to take two things that were perfectly separated, the potassium permanganate in the water, and to mix them together perfectly so that there's no difference in the system. This idea that time goes in only one direction because of some kind of disorder in the system is going to turn out to be one of the perplexing ideas in all of time. I'm going to go back to sharing. If you want to close your eyes while we do the share, go ahead. Now, when we get to the part about Lil getting a new set of teeth, I want you to remember this distorter thing. All right, so hold on to that. We'll get to Lil in a few minutes. Excellent. I haven't broken anything yet. One of the things about time that you need, as the Joyce quote said, is that time is measured by some kind of unchanging beat, counted and displayed. And perhaps to no surprise to anyone who's been outside occasionally, the very first beats were cast by nature. This wonderful old display here has the earth over here. And here we are, and there we go. And we can spin this around and you can see the earth revolving around the uh, sun. That's of course one year. The month is the time it takes the moon to orbit around the earth. Notice I did not misspell moon. That is not a typo. The month is of course the time it takes the moon to go from one phase to the other. And we've adopted it as the month just by dropping one into O's. And finally, of course, the day is simply the amount of time it takes the earth to spin around its axis. Some cultures use noon to noon as a day, some midnight to midnight as we do. Other cultures use the time from sunset to sunset. Whatever they did, they used that unchanging beat of nature as a way of counting time. The Sumerians, the Aztecs, the Chinese all did it the same way. They had one year, they broke it up into moons. Some people use 12, some people use 13. A month was typically having 30 days. And then one day in Sumerian practice had what are called 12 dana. You'll see the root of day right there. You already know where the day comes from. It comes from Sumerian dana. One, and notice there's only 12 of them. One dana was divided into 30 guests. 30, and one guest then was four of our minutes or one degree of the motion of the sun through the sky. Now, all of those things, the year, the month, the day, those, those all had astronomical things going on. Everybody knew what was happening. But those smaller divisions, the Danas, the gas, those aren't natural. Those are man-made. And so the way we count them, the way we find the beat, the way we display them had to evolve over time because there's no natural sequence. There's no natural periods that are doing that beat. Intervals below a day required new tools. We needed a repeatable and varying periodic pacemaker or signal, what we're going to call for the rest of the day an oscillator. By the way, in case you're wondering, oh, wait a minute, let me get my bell. I'm already worried I'm going to run out of time. So here's my oscillator. It's going back and forth. We need an accumulator. An accumulator is something that accumulates the number of periods. And so for example, one, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven. I could accumulate that for as long as I want. I'm not a very good accumulator, but it would work. For those of you watching at home, if you take out your phone and time this, the back and forth swing of this, back and forth, is exactly one second. And so that beat is that natural oscillator of a second that we wanted to do. We don't have any way of accumulating or displaying the total, but at least now we can define the second. It's a pendulum exactly 24.5 centimeters long. We have our oscillator on the left, that's that little pendulum symbol, the accumulator gears in the middle, and then display my favorite time of day, 1234 on the right. All clocks, however you make them, need those three things. I can do that. They didn't do it very well. Here's a better example of a, of a timekeeper. That is the famous Harrison H3 clock, which is on display at the amazing Royal Observatory of Greenwich Museum. If you're ever in London, it's worth the price of admission. This was the first clock that allowed longitude to be determined. It has two oscillators way in the back of the clock. They're not pendulums because Harrison wanted to be able to put this clock on a ship to measure longitude. It has accumulators, gears, and you see those little things, those little like pointer thingies that we might call clock hands? Those are just accumulators. They count the time and then they display it by looking at the dials. And so, for example, you can see that right now there is, uh, let's see, that looks like about a 20. That looks like about a 50. This is seconds. This is minutes. There's the hours. This is a great clock. As we'll see in a little while, it in fact was a rev. Oh, there's the display. It was a revolutionary clock. This idea that accumulators have to map time into space, think about that. They're mapping time into space is really important. No less of authority than Heidegger said in 1927, in Western thought at least, this idea that we map time into space is a common technique. Clock hands do it rotary. And oh, by the way, clock hands, I got to turn around to do this right. Clock hands, right, they go like this. And the reason, of course, is if you turn south and you look at the sun, that's the apparent direction the sun moves as it rotates through the sky. We had it backwards, of course. We're the ones rotating. And so you know right away from looking at a clock that we must rotate counterclockwise because we got it backwards. Notice that timelines map time to linear space. How many of you looked at your calendar on your, cal on your computer this morning and you saw that time was actually vertically in your computer screen? That's just mapping time to space. Calendars map time to two-dimensional space. There's something about humans that require the time be mapped into a different dimension. It's so hard for us to get that time that even artists have had to struggle with it. Faulkner, for example, was absolutely obsessed with time. And his amazing, and I, I reread it recently. I read it in high school and didn't appreciate it. I reread it for, for this, and it's just, it's unbelievable. He is supposed to have written it while he was working in a, a, a power station shoveling coal. He was supposed to have written it on the back of an overturned wheelbarrow. And as I lay dying, Aidy is the mother, her children and husband are attempting to fulfill their mother's dying wish, which is to be buried in a different state. It's a tragic, awful story. And at one point, we hear one of the characters say, he watches Jewel, one of the brothers, as he passes, the horse moving with a light, high knee driving gait 300 yards back. We go on with emotion so soporific, so dreamlike, as to be uninferent of progress as though time and not space we're decreasing between us and it. We don't know what time is. And so we struggle to understand how to talk about it. This proclivity of mapping time into space is perhaps the best ever example is in this amazing 15, what is that, 72, I think. It's on the bottom there, 1574. Uh, this amazing woodcutting by Peter Bruegel, the, the, the elder. Um, we could spend the entire hour going over just this illustration itself. But just to give you an idea of what's going on, let me grab, um, let me grab a pointer so I can, I can look at a pointer. Um, and we're going to, as, as we should, because we're mapping time to space, let's, let's look at this from right to left. Notice that you have father time. And in fact, this is the first father time. Father time is eating the newborn year. 
He's holding in his hand a snake eating itself to represent the cyclicity of time. His globe bears the tree of life, which is being driven by the sun and the moon. Over on the right hand, it's springtime. You have people dancing around the maypole in a festival of uh, reproduction and birth. You even have a couple who look like they're going and celebrating May in their own private way. The parade of time is surrounded by the signs of the Zodiac. Above him is a clock with weights that are driving a pendulum. There's a clock face to show the time, and there's a gong that's about to hit the bell to tell what time it is. Time is looking warily back at death, who is riding a horse in line with a cherubic angel who is looking at the winterscape on the left as the entire linear train of time rolls over the detritus of civilization, which time has destroyed. Absolutely fascinating example of how time is turned into space. And it doesn't end with just that, he says, trying to get his mouse back without saying anything. It doesn't, oh, I zoomed in so you can see it better and I just forgot, sorry about that. Uh, oh, look, father time and child time again. And remember, this was invented by Bruegel. We don't typically see around New Year's father time eating the new baby. That would be politically incorrect and inappropriate these days. But it began in 1574, right here. And of course, there's plenty of examples of Father Time. This one's a nice one from, uh, from 1910. By the way, there's a few things I would normally do in this talk that I can't because of copyright, because we published this. Uh, there will be a time when I will hum a song uh, in, in the near future. I apologize in advance for that. Besides Faulkner, I think one of the people who most is fascinated with time in terms of literature is um, T.S. Eliot. And in the Wasteland, the, the, the second stanza of the game of chess, two women, the narrator and Lil, I warned you about Lil. I told you we'd come back to Lil in her teeth. Notice that the permanganate is completely diffused through this, indicating that over time, the entropy of the system, the disorder, has increased to a maximum. You know, without even me telling you, that if this were one stage in the evolution of this system, and this were the other, you know that this was the starting point and this was the ending point. And that's because you know that over time, disorder tends to increase. And that's exactly what Elliot is looking at in the game of chess. Two women, the narrator and her friend Lil, discuss the return of Lil's husband, Albert, from the war. Lil's life is in tumult at 31. She needs a nice set of new teeth She's reeling from the drug she used to take it off. That is to have an abortion because her husband's coming home. And all of this is punctuated by a barman shouting. And with apologies to all of you, I'm going to read just the last couple stanzas of this. Oh, I'm just trying to decide where to, I'll start here. Oh, is there? She said something of that. I said, then I'll know who to thank. She said, and give me a straight look. Hurry up, please. It's time. And if you look at how this is getting set up, Elliot is punctuating. Wait, I, I, won't, I, I just walked up to point at the screen, and you can't see me when I point at the screen. Elliot is using hurry up, please. It's time to punctuate the passage of time in the poem. If you don't like it, you can get on with it, I said. Others can pick and choose if you can't. But if Albert makes off, it won't be for lack of telling. You ought to be ashamed, I said, to look so antique, and her only 31. I can't help it, she said, pulling a long face. It's them pills I took to bring it off, she said. She's had five already and nearly died of young George. The chemist said it would be all right, but I've never been the same. You are a proper fool, I said. Well, if Albert won't leave you alone, there it is, I said. What you get married for if you don't want children? Hurry up, please. It's time. Well, that Sunday, Albert was home. They had a hot gammon. That's just a French gammon as in a ham. And they asked me into dinner to get the beauty of it hot. 
Hurry up, please. It's time. Hurry up, please. It's time. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. Good night. Ta-ta. Good night. Good night. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. And they leave the bar quoting the Ophelia soliloquy from Act 4 of Scene 5 of Hamlet, where she then goes and drowns herself. This poem is about decay and disorder. This poem is about how time is valued by people because it has something to do with their lived experience of time. And we're worried about that because we all know what comes with age. We all know what's about to happen as we grow older. And we all know this would be a good time for our first question and answer session. So we're going to open up for the questions. If there are any questions yet, we'll take them. And we're going to spend a couple of minutes on this and then we'll get right back to act two. Laura, take okay. it away. I'm here. I, I went ahead and I turned on the option to unmute yourself. If you have a question, please use the little option next to your, um, if you got your video turned on, you should see three little dots or next to your name, or please feel free to put it in the chat and I'm happy to read it out loud to Dr. McKenna. Uh, can you explain how it is more disordered to only move one way through time? Yeah, Laura, I can. Um, and, and to do that, I, I have to do something that the safety office uh, at our university begged me not to do. But of course, that makes it just more fun. Uh, this is a hammer. Oh, am I still sharing? Let me stop. Uh, this is a hammer. And I just happen to have uh, somewhere, ah, here they are, some safety goggles. And I also just happen to have a handy dandy piece of glass. Oh, you can't see it. That's ordered. That's not. And that disorder, that fact that there is no way that I can reassemble. Notice I didn't put my safety goggles on, which I think is pretty funny given the safety office said I couldn't do this. Notice that these, there, I'll put them on for show. This thing is now spread all over the floor. This is disorder. This took energy to make. And if I wanted to pick up and glue together all of the thousands of pieces of glass lying on the laboratory floor now, it would take me energy and time. That's disorder. That's the natural way that time goes because time is defined by this increasing disorder over time. Laura, any more questions? That was the only one we've had so far. Um, anybody else have any questions? Perhaps ones that don't involve potential slicing of your palm. <laughs> Um, oh, okay. So I just saw one from a, Re a Rebecca Gresham who was asking about the accuracy of time. Uh, Ms. Gresham, can we hold off on that for a bit? Because we're going to find that in Act 2. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Gresham. Am I pronouncing that name correctly? Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. So if there's no more questions, which makes me a little nervous, let's go on to Act 2. And I think I'll, I'll just call her Rebecca. Um, I like, by the way, uh, Rebecca, that Old Testament swing to your name. That's, uh, that's cool. Let's, let's talk a about atomic just, time. I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. McKenna, we do have a hand that just went up from Matt. Do we have time to take that one? Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, this is a little provocative, if you don't mind. But in the example of the diffusion of the colored uh, ingredient in the uh, uh, clear liquid, uh, if that colored liquid decayed as uh, time went on so that it became uh, clear also and mixed then with the original clear liquid, would you consider that increasing disorder? And, and, and why do you uh, initially conclude automatically that that wouldn't happen? Matt, I, I, it's not provocative at all. It's a great question. So let's, let's distinguish between color and um, nature. Okay. Let's distinguish between that color purple and the fact that, that that thing I added is a different constituent than water. 
water, and we'll get to this in a minute when we talk about natural kinds. Uh, sorry, I said minute. Um, it's not the color. It's the presence of the different stuff between water. And so originally we started with two piles of stuff, the colorant stuff, which is potassium permanganate and the water. Even if I had added, for example, clear alcohol so that you couldn't see the change in color, the alcohol would have diffused naturally into the water and hence it would have been well mixed. Mm -hmm. Separating those two things, imagine that it was just molecules of alcohol. You could do it. You could perhaps evaporate it. You could perhaps design a reverse osmosis. But the thing is it happened naturally and undoing it takes energy. And that's the direction of time. Yes. Good or more? Oh, no, that's fine. I was uh, okay. just uh, piqued initially by the conclusion that um, uh, the, the colored uh, uh, ingredient would not change over time. And because you were using the appearance of color as a distinguishing feature in your explanation. No, it, it, was a great, it, it was a great question. And the second law is something that gets um, everybody interested. It's always a good discussion. So thank you, Matt. I appreciate that question. Thanks. All right, so let's go to atomic time because, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so we said an unchanging beat driven by technology. Water clocks, sundials, other devices to count time existed as early as the 14th century before the common era, before the common era. We've been measuring time like this for at least 3,400 years. But you can't read a sundial better than two minutes. And a water clock's oscillation are varied by multiple environmental factors, the humidity, how hard the water is, how high the water is. Technology to the rescue. We have to look at the march of times. And here we are, the march of times. Again, I'm going to grab a, uh, I'm going to grab a, a pointer so I can say this. This is for, you know, th those of you who've been to my talks before, you know how much I love graphs. This one's tough, man. So let's take a minute. On the bottom is the year in the common era. By the way, the common era CE is an easier way of saying what time it is. We have to have a zero. And so we're using zero of the common era. Up here is how many seconds a day these different clocks lose. Well, not quite a day. Down here, I have 100 seconds a day, one second, one one hundredth, 36 seconds in a thousand years, 3.6 seconds in a million years, five seconds in the lifetime of the universe. As early as 700 in the common era, the Chinese had clocks that kept time to better than 100 seconds a day. They were down to about 10 seconds a day by the 1100s. In the 1300s, the first clock was made. And that first clock was good to about two minutes a day. By 1500, the escapement was invented, which allowed clocks to get better and better. Harrison's H3, for example, is way up here, where he compensated for friction. He compensated for temperature. He compensated for the strength of the, of the spring that made the pendulum. And then we see increasing over time by the 1900s, we're down to an error of about a hundredth to a thousandth of a second a day. That's pretty good. There we go. The first big step of this though was the escapement in 1300. And the escapement in 1300 was important because it did the role that we know was important. It allowed the accumulation of time without sucking energy out of the oscillator. Here's the oscillator. It's a spring that goes, or sorry, it's a pendulum that goes back and forth, left and right. It's driven by a spring, but this verge escapement only allows the accumulator to turn a little bit each time it swings back and forth. This thing allows the clock to accumulate without taking too much energy out of the pendulum. Oh, sorry, I was supposed to do that. There we go. Once the, um, once the pendulum, excuse me, once the escapement was invented, time kept getting better and better and better and better until finally, by about 1960, this thing called the quartz crystal clock was invented. Now, it came a little bit earlier than that, but it turns out that quartz, when you hit it with a little bit of electrical current, vibrates at exactly the same rate every time. It is the perfect oscillator. You accumulate it with an electric circuit, and you can tell the time to within a fraction of a second. This quartz clock, which is shown with the yellow triangle, is right there at about 36 seconds per thousand years. This was the very first clock 
that could actually measure changes in Earth's rotational velocity. This green line, this upper green line, is the natural variation in how fast the Earth rotates every day. The Earth's rotation changes by a thousandth of a second every day, mostly because of weather. Wind slow the Earth down. And it wasn't until the 1960s that we actually had the ability to realize that we're better than the Earth at keeping time. But it was the invention of atomic clocks in the 1970s, although the idea began much earlier, that has allowed a steady progression of the increase in our ability to distinguish time. The best clocks now, and they're all made by the National Institutes of Science and Technology in Boulder, Colorado, the, the current holder of record is an aluminum clock, which uses exactly one atom of aluminum. I want you to think about that for a minute. These people are building a clock which uses one atom to tell time. And that atom is so perfectly insulated from the area around it that the largest source of uncertainty for the time is how fast that atom of aluminum is moving. It loses less than a tenth of a second in the age of the universe. Hopefully by this time, you're asking, well, wait a minute, how does that work? There we go. And so it works like this. An atomic clock works in a way that you don't think. Actually, it turns out the atom's not all that important because all the atom is doing is acting as a correction device. In atoms, you have electrons. And I've shown that as soon as I can grab my spotlight. There we go. Atoms have electrons. That's this little E thing. And if you take some energy, you can make that electron jump up here. That electron will then jump back down. And when it does that, it emits light. That energy is fixed by the atom. And so that energy is always the same. That light always has the same color. That light always has the same wavelength. That light always has the same period. And it's the perfect oscillator. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. The trick is to take your atom and then hit it with a laser so that the laser is just at the right oscillation to excite that electron, to make that jump, and then to come back down. Here's my electrons. I'm going to do it sideways so you can see it. If you just hit it with any old light, nothing. But if you hit it with just the right frequency of light, you can excite a resonance frequency so that the ones that are at the right frequency, oh, oh, look, I'm getting off tune. Oh, they're stopping. I'll go back and I'll tune my laser to exactly the right. That one's starting to get a little wild. There we go. So I'm going to tune my laser so it's exactly the right frequency to excite the one closer to you. What is your problem, my friend? Here we go. One more time. There we go. And now I know that I have tuned my laser to the exact frequency of that atom. All I got to do is count the waves that they go by, and I have the perfect oscillator and the perfect clock. That's all there is. It's just hit a bunch of atoms, <coughs> wait until they indicate that you're at the right frequency in the laser, boom, you have a perfect clock. Less than a second in the entire lifetime of the universe. It's an astonishing, astonishing physical trait. And it's done best in this country by the National Institutes of Standards. All right, so we got to wait a second. Another good pun. With this technology, we can actually redefine what a second is. It used to be 186,400 of the length of a day in 1900 in the common era. Now, first of all, you think, well, how do we know exactly? So the second is now defined as equal to the time it takes for 9,192,631,770 periods of the laser light that generates a hyperfine, blah, blah, blah. But the point is, now we define the second as lasers. You are perfectly willing or perfectly welcome to ask, what the hell, sorry, what the heck can we do with things like this? Why do we need to know time to this point? Which we'll see in a couple of minutes. Relativity tells us that as you move farther from the Earth's center, time speeds up ever so slightly. You've got 30 seconds worth for every billion years. The Earth's core is about two and a half minutes younger than the top of the planet. 
these clocks are now so precise that you can measure that difference in the passage of time over a distance of about the size of the knuckle of your finger. If I had an atomic clock on the top of this desk and the top of this desk, you could see time flowing differently in the two clocks. So for example, that red line right there, um, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the red line, the red line indicates how precise you need to be in order to have GPS to work correctly. We couldn't do GPS until we had clocks that could fly in space that operated at least as well as that red horizontal line, which didn't lose more than about a second every million years. As we'll see in a minute, that's still not enough. We still have to correct them. All right, so wh why do we care? Well, it turns out that time is a primitive word. So let's look at the etymology of it. Uh, time comes from the Sanskrit word day to divide. And from a root of that, or I guess an extension of that, we get the word daimon to German taimon to English taima, time. From a different root, from daiti to Old English tidon to occur in time to tide, tide. Should I make the pun about time and tide waits for no person? From a different version of it, from da mo, division, we get words like democracy, demagogue, endemic, epidemic, and pandemic. In other words, COVID and time have the same root. Primitive, but timely. Uh, for this slide, I really want to thank or, or, or recognize uh, J.H. Miller's amazing article, Time in Literature, which you can get on the internet. Uh, and then Carol Cleland is the one who told me all about the idea of natural definitions. And she, too, has a great uh, story, Life Without Definitions. Uh, it's a fabulous read. It's free. If this sort of stuff is of interest to you, by all means, I think you should go and read it. Pascal's 1657-ish define time as a primitive word. It doesn't have a definition, right? You can define height. Dog's height is the distance from here to there. You can define a thing by pointing at it and saying, oh, that's a tomato. Time doesn't have that. There's nothing we can point to. We can't define it. The man noted that time is a word that has to define itself, even though you can't prove the thing exists, or that we all have a shared understanding of the word. And so you have to ask, is time a natural kind? You know, we're, we're, on, we're on Zoom, so, so I'll just ask it rhetorically. Define bachelor. Well, it's an unmarried male. Okay, they have to be alive. And it probably has to be after they're adult. And you probably have to exclude the fact that they're a widower. So, yeah, it's a little woolly around the edges. But the idea is we got a definition. And that's because the bachelor is something that we conceive and so we can define it. Define water. And if you went to the usual thing, it's a clear colorless liquid without taste or smell, then this isn't water. In order to have a definition of a natural thing like water, you need to know what it is. It's H2O. We don't know what time is, and so we can't define it. I've wasted all your time in here talking about something I can't possibly define. And I don't know why that's there. That's very odd. Hold on a minute. I'm going to have to do a little escape thing here. I'm so sorry. Okay, go away. Sorry about that. Hold on, people. Go away. Yay! I'm not sure how that happened. Sorry about that, folks. Let's go back to show. Oh, I have to do that first. I'm so sorry about this. There we go. All right, let's share up again. There we go. I'm so sorry about that. Okay, so by now you're probably thinking, I thought this talk was supposed to be about COVID, Larry. It has been. That's all I've been talking about. Mark Whitman is a psychologist, and he notes our sense of body is the basis for our sense of the passage of time. Time and ourselves are 
move together. And it's a circadian rhythm. But if we perceive time as a flow punctuated by oscillations which surround us and then accumulated by us as we walk through the day, we see the sunset, we see the moon rise, we see stars go by. On Monday to Friday, I go to school or I go to work or I go to play bridge. I leave for work at 8 a.m. and I have lunch at 11.30 a.m. and I teach at 2.30 p.m. And of course, the lockdown changed every single aspect of that. Your oscillator broke. Your accumulator didn't accumulate. Your display stopped. I have family in Germany, and they didn't leave the house for weeks. They didn't even go outside. Of course, COVID was weird with time, because every single way you measure time stopped working. Nowhere in the remotest part of your memory did you have any way of establishing your new lifestyle with the old. And so you were out of time. You were a temporal. We all were. We existed without relation to time. This seems like a good spot to ask for questions. Laura, do you want to uh, take a few questions? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to turn on the unmute button, but we do have a question in the chat from Christina. Uh, the device you held up where you were tuning the laser, um, what is the formula that makes the two balls sync up? I'm not asking about the real point, the options merely about the wood and wood device. Okay, so I read that last part to me, Laura. Um, she's not asking about the, oops, sorry. Not asking about the real point, the oscillations, merely about the wood and wire device. Oh, okay. Well, um, <laughs> I did make this device myself. Um, I use it to show oscillations. And the idea is you just take a piece of wood, you take equally massed objects, which I painted differently, and then you put them at wires of different length. And so if you go like this, that's the natural period of oscillation of this device. This little one has a faster oscillation because essentially it's a pendulum. Right. If you held it like this, you would say, oh, that's just a pendulum. But in this case, when you hold it upright, it's a pendulum because the tension in here does the same thing. The piece of wood just allows me to hold it and give everything a constant. And if I go really fast, I can get the little ones to go. Yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. Uh, it's simple. It's good. And I did make it myself. Whoever asked that, thank you for massaging my ego. Uh, it does have a homemade look to it, doesn't it? Laura, go ahead. I see Ginger's hand, but I just want to ask really quickly, Christina would also like to know about the bumblebee on your coat. <laughs> um, so uh, I also designed this. Um, we have a program that encourages four-year, uh, excuse me, two-year community college STEM students to transfer to state universities. It's funded by the Department of Higher Ed. Our program here, which I run with my colleague, Aline Davis, is uh, called A to B, so uh, the Associates to Bachelor, uh, STEM Fellowship. And we study bees in an interdisciplinary way in order to understand all parts of science. And it's essentially an intersection of why bees are declining worldwide because of climate change, pesticides, changes in land use. Thank you for the plug, Christine. I, I appreciate that. That was great. Anyone applying to a four-year university, call me. L McKenna one at framingham.edu. All right, Laura, go ahead. Awesome. I'm so sorry. The computer froze and I, uh, I didn't realize you were still speaking. <laughs> okay, no problem. Ginger, uh, I see your hand. Go ahead. Um, yes. Hi, Larry. Uh, you mentioned that the clocks um, over the years became more and more accurate when more accurate clocks were invented. Uh, but you also explained that the experience of time is relative. Is if you're just using other clocks to measure the accuracy of clocks, then how do you how, how are you able to make that measurement at all, really? So that's a great, that's a great question, uh, Ginger. I assume that's Ginger. Uh, that's a great question. The trick is you let it run for a long, long, long time, and what you do is you essentially take your clock, you take an ensemble of other clocks and you measure your new clock against the ensemble. If the repeatability, <laughs> if the repeatability of your new clock measured over time exceeds out of the ensemble, it's thought to be good. It, it's a classic example, right, of bootstrapping, because how do you measure something more precisely when you have no way of measuring it more precisely? 
One of the beautiful things that the people at NIST do is they figure out these answers. Just, I don't want to get into it too much because I don't have one handy. But the beauty of this optical clock that they're building now is it has this way of automatically allowing you to tell how close the frequency of your oscillator is. And that's one of the reasons it works so well. How's that? Um, so what happens if the laser runs out? Well, the laser doesn't run out. Um, it's typically plugged in to uh, a power source. On GPS satellites, for example, it's fed by electrical power from um, solar panels. So uh, that's cool. All right. So let's go on because I want to get to this last part if we can, Laura. Um, shoot. So let's uh, let's bop on because uh, I don't want to leave you all without the uh, without the denouement. That would be terrible. So I'm going to go share again. Uh, share my sharing. Yes, and we'll do that. There we go. Okay. So we did questions. So let's go to Act Three, uh, which is relative time. And so now we're going to talk about the wholly foreign to most of us, me included, by the way, idea that now doesn't exist. Time runs at different speeds in different places. But time, even the way us, we humans experience it, is relative to some kind of spatial reference. In fact, maybe what we'll argue at the end is that time is only the relationship between you, not her, not him, not they, you, and the space around you. And this idea that time only exists for you and not for anyone else is about as relative as you can get. Uh, so if this weren't uh, being recorded, this is where I would play How Soon Is Now by the Smiths, which is like the perfect song to play here. So just pretend you're listening to whiny 80s uh, post-punk music here. Um, we live in a low energy, low velocity world. The fastest you likely have ever gone is 350, 400 miles an hour. But for most of the history of humans, the most you ever went was like three miles an hour because you were walking and you lived in a village and you didn't go to the next village because it was pretty much like the village you're at now. There's no reason to go. I mean, think about it. 12 hours a day, three miles an hour, 36 miles. The sun moves at about 50 miles a minute. And so even if you spent three days walking, it took the sun less than a minute to travel just as far across the face of the earth. So for millennia, the only time that mattered was the local term, <laughs> the local term, the local time, the time that you get when you look up at the sun and you see the sun is directly ahead of you due south at noon. That was the only time that mattered. Most people didn't even have a watch. They just looked at the sun or they looked at the constellations. If you've, uh, if you've ever read uh, Return of the Native, there's a beautiful example of how to tell the time with the Big Dipper. Railroads and telegraphy brought a slow but sure end to that because railroads do go fast enough that they can beat the sun. Railroads go fast enough so that if you set your time at the Zurich station at a certain time, when you got to Paris, your clock on your watch on the trip was wrong because Paris is so far to the west of Zurich that they used a different time zone than Zurich did. And you would have to reset your watch to Paris time to know what time your train to Lyon was because Lyon used a different time as well. And of course, that brought time zones into existence. 24 hours, 360 degrees. There's 15 degrees per time zone. The time zones used to be easy to do, but the politics of time are tough. And so the time zones now meander wildly. Look, for example, at this one. This one comes down, makes this big jump out here so that Iceland is in the same time zone as the United Kingdom, then scoots around Spain, jumps all the way down to Africa, and then includes Tristan da Cunha for reasons that I don't know. Look how wide the time zone is that we're in. Notice this little blip right around Chicago. Most of the state of Indiana is in the Eastern time zone, except for Gary. Why is Gary, in, Gary Indiana in the central time zone? Because they drive to Chicago to work. They'd be an hour later, an hour earlier, something every day if they didn't have the same time zone. 
Don't get me started on time zones. I really like time zones. But it's worse. And for this part, um, I really want to encourage people. I'll hold it up. This this is a fabulous and inexpensive book. There we go. The Order of Time by Carlo Rivoli. 14 bucks. Excellent read. R written for the, the, the lay person. This is a terrific book if you're interested in time. Speed of Light is vastly faster than anything you've ever done. It's 186,000 miles per second. It's 2 million times faster than a commercial airline. Most humans can only sense an episode of about a tenth of a second. So if you do that out, it turns out that, that light in the time that we can tell travels 18,600 miles. Everything on Earth happens now. The moon is two light seconds away. When you go out later tonight and you look at the moon, which you should because it's going to be beautiful, the light that you're looking at actually left the moon two seconds ago. So if a giant spacefaring tarantula were to eat the moon now, you wouldn't know for two seconds. What's now? Is now now or is now two seconds ago on the moon? The sun is eight light minutes away. When's now? Is it when the light left the sun? Well, how could that be? Because we can't see it. The nearest star is 4.3 light years away. Now no longer exists. Once light has to take a long time to travel. Of course, that was Einstein's kind of the beginning of Einstein. He was very worried about how time and space are really just one aspect or different aspects of the same dimensionality of the universe. Let's do a thought experiment. Let's say that you're riding along in Zurich on a car train, or, you know, on, 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 a, on a trolley. And suddenly you look up and you see it's 11 o'clock on the station clock. And suddenly you are part of the light that is being beamed away from that clock and going off into the universe. So you're traveling with the light that says 11. So you look back and you look at the clock and the clock says 11 o'clock. And then you wait around for a while and you look at the clock and it says, oh, it's 11 o'clock. And you wait around for a while. You look, it's 11 o'clock. When you're traveling the speed of light, time stops. Special relativity. Light's velocity is always the same, no matter where you're going and how fast you're going. So objects in relative motion to each other, when they're moving relative to each other, time changes. Because light speed can't, so time changes. The faster you go, the slower time goes. In October 71, it was actually measured for the first time by putting cesium clocks onto a couple planes flying them around the world. Completely confirmed what Einstein said it would do. Einstein also considered how time and space are distorted by something called mass, that, that space-time is curved. And it's not just space that's curved, it's space-time that's curved. Near a big mass, space-time distorts so much that you actually slow down. Time slows the closer you are to mass. Your toes, assuming you spend a decent part of the day standing, are younger than your ears. Not by much but measurably by the awesome clocks that we have at NIST. The combination fast and slow, far from Earth and fast, matters. In this diagram, we have time slowing down on the vertical axis, and on the horizontal axis, we have how far above the Earth you're orbiting. The space shuttle, for example, is so close to the Earth, and it's going so fast that time slows down a lot. And actually, the space shuttle, time of the space shuttle goes more slowly than it does on Earth's surface. But by the time you get up to about where the GPS satellites are up here, time is actually running so fast that in just three seconds, those clocks up on the GPS satellites have experienced one nanosecond more time than you have. One nanosecond at light speed is exactly a foot. And that means in just three seconds, unless we corrected GPS clocks for relativistic errors, in one second, you'd be off by a foot in two minutes. 100 feet. If you use a GPS to drive today, you're making relative corrections, relativistic corrections to time. Speaking of which, ooh. Larry, I thought you said you were going to talk about COVID. Humans keep time in much the same way that machines do. We have an oscillator and a switch. And when our attention is turned to the switch, 
the switch closes, and we begin paying attention to time. When we start paying attention to time, it accumulates. It accumulates, and it goes into our working memory. We look at the working memory, we compare it to our reference memory in our accumulator, and that's how we tell relative time. If your attention wanes and you don't throw the switch, you don't pay attention to time. If you don't pay attention, the oscillator doesn't get activated and you don't pay attention to time. We pay note to time when we perceive stimuli that gets our attention and that we can store in memory easily at little cost. You all know the saying, sometime time goes by fast. Time flies when you're having fun. Strobe light warning, normal time. Every blip is my making a memory that I see because I'm receiving a stimulus. That stimulus makes me interested, I understand it, and it goes into memory. And at the normal rate at which that happens, that's normal time. When I'm doing something really fun, when I'm having a great time, when the stimuli are new and I can store them easily and they're really vivid, I'm making more memories. And as I make more memories, time appears to go faster. Boom, 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 boom. I'm making memories. My memory, the, 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 the working memory is saying, oh my gosh, look at how many things I'm doing. But that past experience tells you things don't happen this fast. And so time appears to go quickly. When you're bored and you're making relatively few memories, time takes forever. Time slows down. During COVID, time really did slow. Most people, about 80%, found the apparent pace of time, the passage of time judgment, it's called, did change during the UK lockdown. More people felt day and weeks went more slowly than usual. Over a day period, you felt a slowing of passage of time. Sorry, people who felt that time had slowed were associated with increasing age, over 60, increasing stress, more stressed people. Reduced task load, you were bored. Reduced satisfaction with current levels of social interaction. That's the description of the lockdown of COVID. We were all stressed. At least I'm 60, almost. I didn't have anything to do. And I was definitely not happy with my social life. Time slowed down. Over a week period, people also felt the slowing down of the passage of time. And again, increasing age and reduced satisfaction with the levels of social interaction predicted that. This, by the way, is from an absolutely fabulous paper that all of you can read by Ruth Ogden. It was published in, uh, in PLOS. Uh, it's open source, Passage of Time During the UK COVID Lockdown. Absolutely phenomenal. If your day was slow and your week was fast, you experienced time differently than most. Typically, most people said their experience of days and weeks were similar. All right, it's taken me an hour, but I got to the point of the talk. If you thought COVID really did slow down time, you did. It was. All right, parting words. Miller, the guy who wrote the, the literature in time, simply I noted that simply mentioning time in literature or art is not equal to discussing or investigating time, nor with a solely scientific or abstract investigation. Understanding human perception of time is really hard. I think Julian Barnes does it best in Flaubert's Parrot, which is an absolutely fabulous, fun, intriguing book. Barnes investigates time, he investigates place, he investigates space in a most memorable way as the protagonist tries to come to grips with not only his aging and, 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 and changing lifestyle, but whether or not Flaubert really did have a parrot that he kept as a pet. Near the end of the book, his protagonist is visiting a museum in Paris in pursuit of the parrot, and, and I wanted to have a picture of the clock because without it, it really doesn't work. And I actually emailed the Tate Museum in London and said, can I have permission to use this picture that you own? And they said, yes, you can. Thank you. That sounds fab. Just send us 280 pounds. So I want you to, when I change the screen, because I didn't spend the money, when I change the screen, I want you to look at, and it's a J.K. Turner oil. It's amazing. At this dirty, dusty city in Paris, in France, with this huge clock. It's called the, the, the Grand Chronal, the Grand Horal or horology, we'll see in a minute. I want you to imagine that sitting in the background. And here's what the character says. 
I stayed at the Grand Hotel du Nord abutting the Grosse Hollande. And my French is terrible. Anyone who speaks French, I apologize. That's the big clock. In the corner of the room, hold on, I got to move this out of the way. In the corner of my room, running from ceiling to floor, was a soil pipe, a sewer pipe, inefficiently boxed in, which roared at me every five minutes or so and appeared to carry the waves of the entire hotel. After dinner, I lay on my bed, listening to the sporadic bursts of Gaelic evacuation. Then the gross horlone struck the hour with a loud and tinny closeness, as if it were inside my wardrobe. They wondered what the chances of sleep might be. And he goes ahead, he goes to sleep, and he has a dream that he always has about a railway station. He can't find his ticket. He doesn't know what time the train is leaving. He can't find his watch. You'd think that such a dream, he has it every three months. You'd think that such a dream would realize when it had made its point. The dreams have no sense of how they're going down with the dreamer any more than they have a sense of delicacy. The station dream, which I get every three months or so, simply repeats itself, a loop of film endlessly rerunning until I wake up heavy chested and depressed. I awoke that morning to the twin sounds of time and shit, the gross horlonge in my corner soil pipe, time and shit, was Gustav Flaubert laughing. You may not agree with it, but it's certainly the best expression of the relationship of humans to time I've ever read. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I ran over time by seven minutes. Oi, that was terrible. I appreciate your patience and I'm happy to let you go watch the Red Sox or answer questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kent McKenna. Um, we did have a few more questions in the chat and then I see a couple hands as well. Um, so uh, Christina wants a little bit more clarification on your bobbing balls there. Um, she wants to know why the blue and the black balls go in sync and how did you see the wire links? Was it formula or trial and error? Okay. So hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Christina, here you go, hold on, hold on, here you go. Christina, there's my contact information. Okay, is it focus? L McKenna one, there you go. It, uh, it we'll, is not. Okay, so L. one at Framingham.edu. The reason that the blue and the black ones um, are so close is because their distance, their height is so much uh, the same. Roughly speaking, the period of the pendulum is going to go as the square. Oh, thank you. It's going to go as the square root of the length of the of the wire. And I did these two close together to show that they have roughly the same period. And in terms of your other question, did I measure it? No, I just cut up a bunch of, this is high tech. These are golf balls. This is uh, a, a dry cleaner, a hanger, and uh, some epoxy, which uh, people who know me know that I'm never short of epoxy. Uh, but we, I'm happy to share the map with you, Christina. Go ahead, Lauren. All right, we've got another question from an Elise with a suspiciously familiar last name. Uh, for atomic... <laughs> Uh, for atomic clocks, what happens if the laser runs out? How does it actually run forever? So the laser can't run forever, right? Nothing runs forever. That's a manifestation of the second law. But what happens um, with the atomic clocks, for example, at NIST is, pardon me for a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, with the ones at NIST, they don't have to run forever because they're, they're plugged in for one thing. But secondly, um, the clocks only operate as it turns out about half the time. The other half of the time, they're actually doing something else. They're counting. And so it's not an issue. Also, um, the National Institutes of Standard Technology, um, their clock room actually has about 36 different clocks, all of which are good combining to form a, a, a consistent time standard. Again, the only ones that are interesting are the atomic clocks on the GPS satellites. People, think about that. Every GPS satellite has two or three atomic clocks on it, and they run for years. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. The, the, they spend more time ruggedizing the atomic clocks on the GPS satellites than any other part of the engineering of the satellite because they're launching something so delicate on the top of a confined explosion. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> uh, someone just chatted, it makes me want, not want to use GPS. No, no, they're amazing and they're getting better every year. The biggest source of error for GPS is now how fast the signal goes through the ionosphere. That's the largest source of uncertainty in your GPS. Amazing. Laura, go ahead. We've got a raised hand from Fran. Go ahead, Fran. Hi, Larry. Don't know if you remember me. Hi, Fran. Uh, of course, I remember hi. you. <laughs> from St. Louis, right? Yeah. Um, 
So, so I have a memory of a time in 1970s, the seventies when I was learn, studying philosophy. And for me to say that I have a memory is sort of tipping my hand in the direction of what I'm gonna say, which is I learned about solipsism. Okay, so by my memory, solipsism means that all I can know is what I know, one way to put it is right now, this very moment, I know what I know. And I might have a memory of the past. It doesn't mean that, there, that such a thing as the past exists. It just means I'm having an idea or the same with the future. I could think about the future, but really all I know is that I'm here right now having this experience. Can you comment on that? No, A, because you know more about it than I do. And, and I thank you for the lesson. And B, um, I think that's exactly what we were getting at, right? The idea that now is local uh, is one aspect of this. This idea that the past doesn't exist and the future doesn't exist. I think we all agree the future doesn't exist. Um, I'm not sure I agree that the past doesn't exist because if we really, now, if we were looking at this in a, in a Hindu or a Buddhist way, we'd probably take a very different perspective on it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, right. But in the Western tradition, this idea of time rolling, right? And we could talk about two different things. They're, they're in, in the Western tradition, there are really two different conceptions of time, right? There's the, the time zero and there's time cycle. Either way, I think that posits the idea that if you are somewhere on this timeline, like there, and you agree that later you will be here, that at least means that that, I was about to use the word progress, I won't, that traveling has left something in its wake. I, again, you know way more about this than I do, and, and, and maybe on a sidebar we can talk about it more because I'd love to learn more. Mm. Thank you. It's just, it's always a concept that's fascinated me. You know, it stops me in my track sometimes where I say, all I know is that I'm having a thought about something I consider to be the past. Please, okay. read, please read all of it. It's, it's, a, it's a surprisingly good and insightful, and it talks exactly about the idea. It goes at the beginning rather, you know, for generalists, but rather technical. And at the end, He's discussing the same sort of things you are. You would love this. Um, and I recommend it highly to, uh, to anyone who wants to do more about this. Uh, that's the great thing about time, right? Because we can't define it. And so we can have all these lovely discussions about it. Mm. Thanks, Laura, Larry. Go ahead. You're the best. Oh, you're welcome, Fran. Thank you. I see uh, a couple questions in the chat, but I'd like to ask a, a question of my own selfishly. Oh, okay. Um, go ahead. You said not to get you started on time zones. But I wondered if you had any thoughts on daylight savings time and how humans perceive time in daylight savings. Okay, so that's a great question. So I'll tell the joke. Uh, there was a time a few decades ago where Indiana at one time of the year had four different time zones. We happened to be driving through with, with my family at the time. Uh, and we stopped at a restaurant to eat lunch and we were all confused. And so we said to the waitress, what time is it? And she says, how do I know it's Indiana? And walked away. And that's because even, even though they lived there, the idea that there was a place in central time, a place in Eastern time, and then did celebrate and did not celebrate daylight saving time. And so there'd be four things. Why did we do daylight saving time? Because of tradition. There was this English guy in the mid uh, or late 19th century he was a big proponent of exercise, and he thought that it would be a good idea. Remember, he lived in a manor. It would be great for the working classes if we had an hour extra at the end of our busy day where we could go outside and enjoy the sunlight. And that's literally where daylight savings come from. Do we need it now? Well, uh, in Maine, in eastern Maine, where my father lives, it gets light at 3.30 in the morning in the summers. It's crazy. We really need to be in the Atlantic time zone, I think. Other people hate it. If you're at the other end of the time zone, if you're in the time zone, say in Ohio, which is more than an hour east or west of here, then things don't ever get real until you get to the daylight saving. 
it's a complicated question of what part of the day you want to live in. Look at all these lights that we have. With all these lights, we don't care anymore. It's dark out. 150 years ago, we would never be anywhere but home right now. Unless it was a full moon and we could walk in the full moon, which it almost is. So I, I'm not going to share with you my personal. I happen to love daylight saving. I think we should do it year round. But it doesn't save money. It doesn't save lives. It doesn't do anything except shift for an hour when you get up. Thank you. A couple more questions in the chat. Um, so we'll just take these last three here and then we will be officially out of time, ding. Um, <laughs> so why two to three clocks on a satellite is what Christine Oh, would okay. Like redundancy, 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 and redundancy. Someone asked, I believe it was uh, Ginger, who asked, how do you know which clock is right? Well, if you have only one clock, you know it's wrong. You know, it's got to be wrong. If you have two clocks, you don't know which one is right. And so you're still pretty badly off. They have three clocks and two of them are always hopefully going to give you the same time and one of them won't. Um, the next generation of GPS satellites is going to have a particularly fine clock on board. Ironically, GPS satellites aren't dying as fast as everyone hoped. They're actually so well built. They're lasting decades longer than people wanted. So the, the clocks that are up there are really old and we're just waiting for the satellites to die so we can launch the, the, the clocks from the 2000s up there. So it's only going to get better for GPS. Oh, uh, Fran, yeah. There you go. Go ahead, Laura, and ask another question while I pull this up for people. Sure. Um, I'm glad you mentioned GPS because that's our next question. Uh, Matt would like to know what time accuracy does the GPS in our cars need and how accurate in feet might this be? Okay, so here's the great hidden unknown about GPS. Your GPS receiver does not have a clock on board. Right, think about it. GPS can fit on your watch now. There's not enough room for an atomic clock in that tiny little watch. The beauty of GPS is that what it does is it says, okay, I'm going to listen. So here's the earth. Yeah, I can more or less see that. Here's you. And it takes the signals from four GPS satellites. Not one, not two, not three, four. And each of these satellites basically says one thing. It's 10, 34, 31.0000001 oh, 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 seconds. And it sends that signal, what time it is, to your receiver. All of them do. And then what the receiver does is it figures out where and when on Earth it has to be in order for all of these signals to have been sent by those satellites and received at that receiver at the same time. If you remember Mrs. Starbleblock from high school algebra, she said, class, you need as many equations as variables in order to solve them. Latitude longitude, height, and time. Four variables, sorry, four unknowns, four time signals from four satellites, you know where you are. One nanosecond, one billionth of a second is one foot. Your GPS now is good to better than 10 feet at any one time. That means that we're solving these equations to better than 10 nanoseconds all the time. It's crazy. When I first started uh, this journey, I um, there's a sextant around. Can you find the sextant around? I started doing celestial navigation to learn how to get a boat from one place to the other. Yeah. So pretend I have a sextant in my hand. It's somewhere. Um, the whole thing about using celestial navigation was it was impossible to know what the time is. And now I can hold in my hand something that measures it to a billionth of a second, and I know where I am to 10 feet at any time. It's an astonishing triumph of technology. Okay. Um, I know we've got a couple more questions, but we really have to end well, with this last question. I understand. Question. But everybody's got my email. If you have any questions, just email me, and I'll answer them back. Um, Donna would just like to know, did you double major in physics and English? <laughs> <laughs> no, but as we all as we all learned during COVID, had a lot of time on our hands. 
<laughs> All right. Well, do you want to wrap us up with one sort of summary of something that we should take away from just this brief hour long overview? No, just um, just. Uh, thank you all for coming and thank you to the Framingham Public Library and the Lifelong Learning uh, uh, Series. This is my favorite thing to do every every year. And I appreciate you all coming and giving me the opportunity to share with you today. And Laura, thank you for all the help you did in putting this together. Thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing your scholarship with us. We really appreciate it. Um, please join us for our next Lifelong Learning, which will be next week and if, give me two seconds and I will have that title pulled up for you. Um, Dr. Amy Finstein will be here. She will talk about a highway runs through it. So please join us next week. Same Zoom link, same time. Um, we'd love to see you there and putting our program evaluation in the chat. Please let us know what you thought and if you have any ideas for the future. Have a good night everyone. <laughs>